Kia ora everybody and welcome to Get Into Gaming. My name is Josh Carmo, aka Blame the Robot, and I'm excited to be your host for the first episode in this video series. Together, we'll be exploring the many career opportunities the game industry has to offer. We'll talk with gaming industry experts and pro gamers about the career pathways and skills you'll need to get in the game. We also have resources available online at getintogaming.nz for future reference. As I mentioned before, my name is Josh Carmo and I'm your host for today. I first joined the gaming world as a variety streamer on Twitch and content creator on YouTube. I've since had the opportunity to host many video game panels, stages, and even present talks about gaming at events such as Armageddon, Play by Play, and the New Zealand Game Developers Conference. Today's topic is esports, one of the most competitive scenes in gaming. Players all over the world train tirelessly to be the best in their field. Teams will compete on a global stage in games such as League of Legends, Street Fighter, and Fortnite to secure their place among the best of the best. To tell us more about esports, we've invited industry experts to talk about how New Zealand finds its place in the world of esports. Have you guys seen esports and the E-League? I don't know if that's sports, uh, but, but it's no, great no, no, mind savvy. It. But I don't know if athlete is the right word that I yeah, would go for. You don't break a sweat. I don't consider it a sport. No, 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 you do. Yeah. Watching people play video games isn't like watching people play football. It's like watching people play fantasy football. It is one more step removed from human activity. You understand? It's video games. It's, it shouldn't be on a sports network. It's video games. But it, can it truly be a spectator sport? Um, it already is. 71 million uh, watched it last year. They reckon it's going to, by 2017, it'll be 145 million people watching it. They're actually giving college scholarships for video, for video, for video gaming. Uh, and it's even gone to the point that now the government has acknowledged video professional video gamers as athletes. Same way you watch a football match, you can hear the crowd, everyone's cheering the team on, you make friends, these are people you talk to, you play with online. It's all about community, it's being part of something that you're incredibly passionate about. Trying to establish vision control and force oh, Eddie Steele. Eddie Steele, Steele. take that ambition shot! Ambition! Steals the arm of the dragon! The Elder Dragon! The Elder Dragon! This is a four Drake Elder Dragon! He lives! Ambition saves the game once again! Now, our first guest is uh, for the segment is Henry Lawton, uh, director of Victory Up and involved in the New Zealand Esports Federation, who is currently running the National High School Esports League this year. Uh, kia ora, Henry. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, kia ora. Thank you for having me. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, um, as our first guest, I kind of have the absolute pleasure of asking you the big question. What is esports? What is esports? The easiest way for me to explain it is esports is competitive gaming. Um, you look at it in the sense of traditional sports, and you put us in the digital realm. It's probably that's the simplest e way I could break it down. <laughs> that's real good. Um, and esports has kind of been around for uh, uh, quite a long time and spanning across like different um, kind of like gaming categories and stuff, right? Yep, yep, correct. Um, you know, you have your traditional sports category, which everyone relates to. Um, you know, the last generation of, of MOBA, you know, that started to come out and that's probably the heavy players, uh, FPS, your Counter-Strike, your Valorant, uh, Overwatch. Yeah, it's uh, the beauty of esports is it, it covers a lot of different genres. Yeah, and I just mentioned uh, a lot of very like official sounding stuff in uh, <laughs> your introduction, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, your role, what your role in the world of esports is? Um, well, my role. 
the, the simplest way for me to explain it is um, me and my co-founders had a passion for competitive gaming. So we entered the esports realm under the competitive gaming banner. Uh, we're console gamers. Uh, 2K was our jam. Uh, there was nothing sort of official for us to, to play. You know, um, we have the 2K mm. league now. Everyone's sort of gunning for that. Um, but when we started, uh, uh, man, Twitter tournaments, Facebook tournaments, and you get to playoff rounds, and all of a sudden, no one wants to play. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my introduction into it. Uh, and victory up started because of that reason was, man, we need to take this one step further. We need to start giving opportunities. Um, it can't just be us sitting at home jamming this game. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned Victory Up. Uh, Victory Up. What is that? Uh, so Victory Up is a multi-owned company. Um, we established around four years ago um, by playing the game, uh, and that's all it started with. It was party chat, and it was just conversations every week. You know, I'm at the age where the only time I get to catch up with my boys is online. Um, you know, partners won't let us. <laughs> it's not the old <laughs> days where we used to go out to the bars and, and catch up. So. You know, the only box we play is the Xbox now. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so Victory Up started started four years ago. Uh, the whole reason was to sort of create a scene for Aotearoa to get into competitive gaming. Uh, we've taken it from that simple idea, because um, that's all it was at this stage, um, to we're now supporting grassroots esports throughout New Zealand. Uh, we now dabble quite heavily within the health and wellbeing of esports players and those in the community. Um, Victor out real passionate in the uh, at-risk space as well, especially for our rangatahi Māori and, and getting that uh, balance between the physical and digital realm. Um, Victor up and you could describe as an esports infrastructure company. That's really cool. Um, are there any kind of uh, teams or companies that you work with closely to do this? Uh, so currently we work with an awesome company based up in Auckland, ShadowNet. Um, they've come on as our primary broadcasters for our uh, high school esports league. Um, and then we are releasing a tertiary league shortly. They'll be there alongside us as well. Um, we're building some awesome relationships around the country. You know, Digital Natives Academy, the Rotorua, uh, Game Tan up in Auckland, um, Christchurch City Libraries, you know, um, which is a strange one for people to hear, but Christchurch City Libraries are very heavily involved in the esports scene this year. Um, and they're, they're providing some amazing opportunities. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a number of people. Let's play live, you know, our powerhouse here in New Zealand. Uh, so been working closely with Duane on some projects, uh, you know, just ideas, throwing them at him, getting thrown back at me, uh, <laughs> you know, just the usual. <laughs> what would you say is your kind of like vision for Victory Up in the future? Um, for me, it's just around establishing a, a solid grassroots platform, creating pathways for our athletes. Um, you know, people still, that stigma is still there that esports isn't a sport, you know, it's an official sport now in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, we can, we've got the opportunity to develop something real meaningful. We've got an opportunity to actually shape what that looks like in the future for the next generations to come. Um, so for Victory Up, it's just about putting our mark down there, you know, saying we were a part of that with all these other amazing groups. Um, currently, you're working closely with the New Zealand Esports Federation on the uh, National High School Esports League. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Yep, so um, National High School Esports League is pretty much what it sounds like. <laughs> A national um, competition that spans the whole country. Um, what we've done differently to previous, e previous years sorry, is um, we've broken it up into regions. So we have our Canterbury region, Otago region, Wellington, Waikato Tainui in Auckland, all based on Super Rugby, because that's what we know and love um, in, our, in our team. <laughs> um, so, you know, and change the change the format of the competition to sort of reflect traditional sports so that there was a easier understanding um, compared to previous years. Um, so, you know, the, these schools are competing in games like League of Legends, Valorant, Rocket League, NBA 2K. Um, they're competing weekly. Uh, the schools in Christchurch down in Canterbury, you know, they have the opportunity to go to the Christchurch libraries every Wednesday and compete um, pretty much live with their opponent in the land match. You know, so uh, Digital Natives are hosting um, their local schools as well, their local kura. So, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, yeah, we're just trying to trying to create that face like it's traditional sports, realistically, yeah. Fantastic. And if I wanted to get my high school involved or anything like that, how would I go about doing that? 
Um, the easiest thing is to reach out to us, you know, um, reach out to Victory Up. So www.victory-up.com. Um, hit the contact us form. Um, we've closed off for this year. You know, we treat it like sports, so registrations are closed. Um, we run a round robin tournament. We don't we don't focus on the Swiss format. We don't believe the Swiss format's that fair in terms of um, competitive environment. Uh, so the next opportunity is next year. You know, um, 2022. So yeah, we're really lucky. We've got over 1,100 students participating this year. Um, we're up to 71. 1,100 students. students. Yeah. And yeah, 71 schools. That's insane. 71 schools. Yeah. So about 208 teams are being fielded this year. So, um, you know, we're really stoked with, this is our first year operating at a national level. So we're really stoked with the sort of uh, participant numbers that we've, we've gave it in the end. Um, yeah. But um, I guess like finally, again, like if we wanted to kind of sign up to Victory Up and learn more about uh, your company, where would we find you? Yeah. So, um, like I said before, easiest place is our socials, um, Victory Up NZ. If you go look on Facebook, Insta, uh, Twitter as well. Although I'll be honest, we're not that active on Twitter. Um, and then our URL is www.victory-up.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Henry. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you and get some insights on uh, the kind of like high school level esports that we have in here in New Zealand. I appreciate you having me on board. Thank you. All right, no, thank you so much. Uh, we will be returning uh, very soon with our next guest. However, we'll be taking a break and be back soon. All right, kakite on all. We'll see you soon. What's up guys? Now this next interview is with Erin from Let's Play Live. Now she is the head of platform and publish, publisher relations at LPL. Welcome Erin, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk about esports. Thank you. Um, now tell us Erin, who are you and what is your background? So my name's Erin and as you delightfully said, I am head of publisher and plat uh, head of pub platform and publisher relations at Let's Play Live. Now, Let's Play Live is an oceanic tournament broadcaster and esports tournament operator, and we run a bunch of different tournaments, and we broadcast them around the world and on TV. So my role is I oversee all of our platform because we have a really awesome platform, which is automated, which means that we can run a tournament from end to end through this platform system. So I oversee all the events and I create events and I create tournaments on this platform. And some of them you may have seen on TV because we've had it on both Nordi TV and Sky Sport New Zealand. That's awesome. Now, how did you find yourself working for LPL? Uh, so last year, uh, during, I came back to New Zealand because of COVID. Um, and then I had the opportunity to apply for a lead administrator role at Let's Play Live because my predecessor, at, uh, she left during lockdown because she was an awesome opportunity in Australia. I had the opportunity to apply for it and the team loved me and they uh, decided to give me the opportunity to work there. And since then I've had um, two promotions into the current role that I have. So obviously the strategy and direction of our Let's Play Live platform. Congratulations, that's awesome. Now you said that Let's Play Live do a little bit of tournaments. Can you um, tell us what kind of tournaments those those are? Definitely can. So currently right now we have five different games that we have tournaments in. Uh, we have got Valorant, Counter-Strike, PUBG, Dota 2 and Rainbow Six Siege. Um, all of them we are, we are in season two of because our platform runs three seasons of league play during the year. So we're in season two of our tournaments for them. But we've also had the opportunity this year to team up with both Riot and also Ubisoft to deliver the 
uh, for Riot to deliver the Ballarat Oceana Tour, which is the Australia New Zealand's region to go up onto the international stage uh, for competitive Ballarat esports. And also we teamed up with Ubisoft to deliver the Oceanic Challenger League for Rainbow Six Siege, which is a really awesome opportunity and the first of its kind for the region. Those are some very, very big names that you guys are collaborating with. Um, now, one thing I find quite interesting is that the LPL studio is literally attached to the Sky Tower. Now, the Sky Tower is arguably the most iconic building in New Zealand. Uh, you guys are on that most iconic building in New Zealand, um, and you guys also stream to Sky Sports. Now, how would you say that that has affected the image of esports in New Zealand? Well, to be honest, I think because if you're anywhere near the Sky Tower and you can see the Sky Tower, looking up from the base of the Sky Tower, you will see the wraparound glass windows with big letters of Let's Play Live Esports Studio. So it's definitely as an advantage for us going there because a lot of people are like, what the heck is this? And then they go on and look into who we are and what we do and learn a bit about esports. But also it's a big draw to a number of people with the fact that Let's Play Live is in an iconic building such as the Sky Tower, I'm quite sure we have one of the best studio locations in the world just because no one else can say that in a, what a, a, like a national icon or anything like that. So we're very lucky about that. Um, but Auckland and uh, the Sky Tower and the location is absolutely great. I know that in a few years we are going to be getting a bit too big for the studio uh, just because we can't really expand because in the middle of it is all the elevators that get up to the top of the building. So eventually we'll have to expand, but I don't think we're looking at leaving that location anytime soon because it's just great and built us fits our needs right now. It is a great location. And so any of you guys who are watching and end up by the Sky Tower, if you look up just at the base, there's like this um, almost donut around that is an is LPL. There's literally a esports um company right there that is so cool so make sure you guys who are watching if you guys end up sky tower keep an eye out for it um now erin you... also... sorry i was just gonna say if anyone does want to have a studio tour you can always reach out to one of the team at let's play live and we're always open to taking people through and having a chat about esports i've actually been through it myself it's awesome so if you guys have the opportunity i would definitely recommend taking that up um now erin do you have any advice for anyone that's looking to enter the esports industry in new zealand I think get involved with whatever area interests you is the first step because you don't, there, there's a lot of avenues where you can get into esports because there's a lot of similar, similarities between broadcasting like TV broadcast, also sports. So if you like any of the roles in those two industries, then there's bound to be a similar, if not the same one in esports. and. I think that just getting involved, at, um, seeing if you can either work at physical events or volunteer for online events if you don't, if you're not close, or even work for online um, online tournaments or anything if you're not close to a physical event, get involved, have a look, try it out um, because a lot of our region is really uh, welcoming and accommodating. Um, to people who do want to get into this industry, and if you do have questions, like I said. You can reach out to Let's Play Live, any of the team. We're more than happy to help you on your way into esports. It gives you directions on what you want to get into. Um, and that's something that I've noticed about this industry is that everyone's really welcoming and they're all so passionate about getting the scene gr growing because esports are still very new in this region. So everyone just wants it to be a success. So they help each other out a lot um, with it. Awesome. Hey, Erin, thank you so much. That's all that we have time for today, but we really appreciate you joining us and sharing the insights into esports and LPR. No problem. You have a lovely day as well. Thank you. You guys can find out more about Erin and Let's Play Live on our website, getintogaming.nz.
Welcome back, guys. Our next interview is with Jason Spiller from Direwolves. Hi, Jason. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and it's my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Now, Jason, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about your background? Uh, of course. So, yeah, my name's Jason Spiller, as, uh, as you pointed out, and I am really... Uh, you know, the, the way I really look at, um, uh, at, at what I do is, is, is it's all about gaming and esports. And, and I've had the benefit and the privilege of being in gaming for a very, very long time. You know, currently, uh, I am the owner and team principal of the Direwolves, uh, but my background has been a, in corporate gaming. So I worked for Xbox. Uh, I uh, helped uh, the publishing team here in New Zealand do a lot of their releases, everything from Halo through to Gears of War to Quantum Break and some of the other really exciting titles of that era. And uh, I've worked for companies like HP developing their Omen brand. Uh, and working on building out uh, strategies and, and ways of, of getting PCs uh, into gamers' hands. Uh, and yeah, now it's it's all about esports. So I bought the Direwolves about a year ago uh, as a team and uh, now currently look after all of the operations. So I took the title Team Principal because that generally, honestly, encompasses and represents what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I have a whole range of responsibilities from making sure that all of our players are happy, uh, making sure that our fans are well engaged, and making sure that our partners and the people that you know make esports teams work, that they're all happy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit more about how esports organizations actually work? Like what does, what encompasses an esports organization and what do they do? So esports organizations are a pretty complex animal, right? There's there's so many parts to them. If you look at the Direwolves, we're about 75 players on the field. So we compete in nine different games at the moment in 12 different leagues. Uh, that's a huge amount of people. And, and their their role is pretty straightforward, right? They, they jump on and they play League of Legends, they play Overwatch, they play Quake uh, and uh, Rocket League, a whole range of other games. But we've got a whole bunch of other people that are part of the organization, about 35. And they do a whole bunch of different things from look after the finance, because the reality is, is uh, an organization like this has, uh, you know, a range of, of financial needs. The, the cash has to come through to pay these players uh, and to pay everybody that helps with the organization. Uh, we've got a whole range of content creation staff. So people that do video, that, uh, that do photography, that do editing, uh, that make sure the content we're putting out there is top notch and, uh, and up to scratch with the rest of the region and the rest of the world. Uh, and we've got a uh, you know a series of people that do things like social media. Uh, we've got team managers. We've got coaches. We've got physiotherapists that you know help our players keep in top shape. We've got nutritionalists uh, because you know everybody on field uh, needs to be at their best, and the only way they can be at best when they're playing League of Legends or Overwatch or any other game is to make sure that you know they're looking after themselves, they're eating healthy, they're exercising, and they're maintaining a balanced lifestyle because it all feeds into that competitive performance. So you awesome. know, in terms of what, uh, yeah, and so as, as an esports organization, that's, that's really our job. It's to make sure that uh, players are supported, uh, that they have everything that they need to succeed. Now, whether that's, you know, team managers, whether that's coaches, whether that's analysts to actually go back through their game performance, really pull out the kind of statistics that are going to help them succeed in the next game, or whether it's people to help them with their social media presence and build their profiles up, or whether, uh, you know, it's people that just, you know, honestly do other stuff for them, like help build out their merch lines and, and things like that. So that's what team organizations do at a core. It's, it's all about making sure that the players are supported uh, and um, maintaining a business that can continue to do that long term. Awesome. Hey, thank you for that insight. Now, being an international company with esports teams that compete all over the world, how does the image of esports differ in New Zealand compared to other countries? So that's that's obviously a, a pretty complex question. Um, and let me answer it in two parts. So, you know, you, you touched upon the fact that we are an international team. So we've got players all over the show, right? And then we've got a whole bunch of Kiwi players. We've got some Australian players. Uh, we've got some Malaysian players. Uh, we've had in the past some Korean players, although we don't have them on the roster at the moment. Uh, and if you look at some of our players, they're playing overseas. Uh, Zeniku, who's a Quake player, he currently lives in Warsaw in Poland. Uh, if you look at somebody like Dylan, who's just won the FIFA uh, World Cup 
uh, regional zonal qualifiers, he's headed off to London uh, in August to compete uh, with the top in the world. So there's, you know, there's there's a whole range of, you know, that's that's the beauty of esports, right? Is that it's really borderless. It's not about, uh, you know, one nation or another. You you can succeed globally, and that kind of leads into the second part of your question, which is what. Uh, you know where is esports at in other countries, and the reality is, is it's it's probably a lot further along. You know, New Zealand's playing a bit of catch up at the moment, and mm-hmm. you know there's, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. And I think a big part of it is that New Zealand has such a proud history uh, of uh, competitive performance on a traditional sports field. You know, we're avid cricketers and uh, uh, rugby players, and so you know as as a result, things like esports have been a little slower to adopt than in countries where uh, you know before performance uh, at a mental level has has been you know really one of the predominant things you look at the eastern european countries countries where it's cold <laughs> where uh, you know a lot of indoor sports are, uh, are more popular so there's a little bit of an advantage you know globally you've got massive things happening you've got uh, teams now that are uh, you know expanding into you know 50 million dollar performance facilities uh, you've got uh, teams that are taking home prize pools that number into the the 40 or 50 million dollar range uh, you've you've got teams on full time salaries that you know are earning six figures a year. Uh, not to mention you know all of the support staff surrounding that. You've you've got coaches that are going on to lead uh, amazing careers coming off the field into commentators. Uh, you know in in wider esports tournaments. So I, I think the short answer is is it's it's really big. There's a, a really established professional ecosystem out there now internationally uh, that we're only really just starting to touch upon here in New Zealand. Now, if Kiwi kids wanted to get involved in esports and kind of get behind the scenes with esports, what advice would you give them so that they can um, do that with their with their future? So, uh, you know, that's, uh, again, that's a tough one because there, there, there's no right or wrong way to get into esports because we need just about every kind of career possible you know if if your passion is numbers uh, and you want to go into finance or accounting you know what we need good esports accountants uh, if you wanted to go down one of the more traditional academic routes and go for lawyers you know what esports has a a severe lack of of legal counsel that knows what they're doing when it comes to esports contracts they're very very different uh, but you know if you want to get into any of the other elements whether it's coaching or uh, or you know physiotherapy or team management. There are a whole range of courses. Waikato University does some great stuff in terms of sports psychology uh, that you know you can get into and you can really get a good basis to then move into esports. And I think that's one of the really really critical things is if you look at my team and myself, we've done a lot of other stuff. Uh, you know, none of my team started in esports. Uh, they've all had a passion for esports, they've all had a passion for gaming, but they've gone and they've done other things in their career to get the kind of experience that makes them incredibly good at what they do. Uh, you know, if you look at our head of production or our um, uh, head of video, each of them, one of them came from Sony Music uh, and one came from TVNZ. So, you know, they've, they've got a whole range of experience knowing how to put professional product together in other areas and then have brought that skill set into esports. So, you know, one thing that I'd, I'd always say is is never stop learning no matter what your specialty is uh, and never lose the passion for, for gaming and esports because that passion is going to be evident no matter, you know, where you are in the industry. Uh, but having a well-balanced and wide range of, of skills, that's going to that's gonna get you even further. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that insight, Jason. We appreciate having you here. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. And you guys can find more about Jason and Direwolves on our website at getintogaming.nz.
Welcome back everyone. We're continuing to get into the gaming and the world of esports with our next guest. Our next guest started their career transitioning from competing in Team Fortress 2 to color casting. He's most well known for covering the Overwatch League and Overwatch contenders and we're excited to have them here. It is my pleasure to, wel pleasure to welcome Kevin aka Avril. Hey Avril, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Fantastic. So, uh, Kevin, tell us about yourself. Uh, what is it that you do as a broadcast talent? So, um, yeah, there it is. I work as professional broadcast talent uh, for currently the, the two main areas in Valorant Esports for North America and primarily in the Overwatch League um, as well for Overwatch Esports. And Overwatch League is a globally franchised sports league kind of modeled after NFL, NBA kind of stuff. Um, with uh, franchise city-based teams all around the world, uh, like New York and Los Angeles, Shanghai, London, etc. So uh, really cool stuff. It's been operating for uh, four years. So we're in, it's, we're in the fourth year of the league so far, the first uh, year that I've joined the league. And, um, you know, I work as broadcast talent specifically in commentary. Um, so, you know, I, I call the action, um, analyze the games. Um, you'll see my face on the broadcast and hear my voice on the broadcast. And that kind of stuff, really, really similar to what you would get in, you know, traditional sports. And you you tune into a sports broadcast and you hear the uh, talent talk about the game and, you know, commentate over the game. I do that for, for esports and for gaming um, and for a franchise league. And uh, how long have you been in the industry? Um, I would say professionally since 2016, about the end of 2016, um, was when I was first getting my, you know, uh, paid gigs and, and really starting to move into, you know, the realm of doing things more professionally um, for conversation, eventually moving into it being like my only job and my only source of income in my, um, you know, my actual career. For that as well, I mean, you mentioned like there was some history there with some, some playing as well, uh, where I was maybe, you know, doing stuff more as a hobby, just working. Well, I wouldn't even say working. It would just be, you know, kind of having fun with it and um, doing commentary mm. stuff just for fun as a hobby. Um, and probably did that for a good five-ish years, maybe even six from 2011. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been a long journey from there. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned that people can kind of come at this from uh, mul like different directions. Um, and it is more or less kind of like a, a muscle that you have to train over time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh what it is you do during like one of these kind of competitions how is it that you uh offer your color commentary to a match a couple of ways you would look at it is typically it would be like an in-studio kind of thing and i do some studio-based work currently i did a lot more last year actually i think like when we look back well actually not last year it was like two years ago 2019 before before COVID 19 really started hitting um there was a decent amount of traveling in there a lot of studio work um going place to place i think that's where the real esports is at where, where the live events and stuff like that before uh, we moved to predominantly online so um all the stuff i have going on home right now i guess like there's this sort of two versions behind it one is the the live element where you are you are physically going to a studio or in some cases you know back in 2019 you could be traveling quite some length to another country um and going to an event um and then the the online portion you know you, you, you could be doing stuff uh where you know you're broadcasting from home you have a, a broadcast kit at home as well so i've i have a, a bunch of stuff um that are provided to me by Activision Blizzard for the Overwatch League, and that's a, that's currently an online bro broadcast and as an international event. And how how important are these tools that you use uh, to become like a broadcast talent um, for someone who's just starting out? Uh, what would I need to be able to do what you do? A headset with a microphone, and that's it. Um, you wouldn't you spend nothing on it. You don't don't worry about equipment. Equipment's the last thing you need. You don't even need a camera yet um spend as little as possible really no one should be no one should be dropping money on equipment until they're really getting serious it's like you know when you get into anything you're not you're not buying you know a fender stratocaster when you're learning how to play a guitar you're not buying you know you're not dropping thousands of dollars on musical equipment when you're just learning you know you're on a starter drum kit you're on a you know you know your first cricket bat's going to be pretty rubbish like don't you're not dropping any amount of big money on anything that's brilliant um now, as someone who's 
kind of forever forever locked in bronze uh how deeply do i need to understand the game if i want to offer any kind of color commentary you would for color commentary specifically you probably want to be um ideally you'd probably want to be an expert um it depends on like what angle i mean color commentary is very broad in terms of what the the role encompasses like you want to it's uh you know you want to be entertaining you want to be someone that is um charismatic and likable that uh, i think in esports um and i would say in sports in general you, there there's uh somebody within a commentary duo or potentially trio um who is who needs to be quite knowledgeable um and so you have another thing called the play-by-play -play caster who's who's there to call you know action as it happens on the fly I would even say that though those people in esports need to be reasonably well read up and uh, well researched and um, fairly knowledgeable. But a lot of commentators in the color position are like ex professional players, ex coaches, or you know some sort of analytical person, some sort of person with an analyst background um, that really understands the topic well. So um, for that level, of, like depends what your goal is. I mean, let's be clear. Like if you're trying to if you're trying to work at you know um the very highest level possible that you can absolutely attain in the world then you probably need to be matching that level by being you know one of the top experts in the world but you know it scales down like if you're if this is a hobby thing um there's, there's no there's no you know prerequisite there you just you just do whatever you want really i guess that's um kind of what it uh one of the uh, major responsibilities uh, that a broadcast talent would have, right? Uh, I mean, like, people all over the world are kind of looking to you to give them insights in the different strategies that people implement, and of course, the tools that they use as well, whether it be the characters, the weapons, or um, perhaps even the skills that they need to use. Absolutely, yeah, yeah you're, you're, seen, you're seen as like an ambassador for the game, and you're seen as someone that is, you know, um, has something to say that people want to listen to generally that's probably why you're hired if, that, if you're talking about it at that level so yeah i mean this is this would be like if you were you know working on on sky sport for for rugby commentary you know you you're generally talking about people that have been professional rugby players stuff like that or you know whatever sport it is so it's not it's not really any different in esports now, I imagine that in the world of like competitive hero shooters, it can be quite difficult for someone like me to stand out. Do you have any tips for those who are looking to get into um, broadcast commentary or broadcast talent or color commentary, of course? Uh, sure, and this, uh, this extends like way beyond hero shooters, anything like that. You know, it's kind of for just esports in general. Um, uh, to sort of get your feet wet into it, you'll, you'll want to um as cliched as it sounds just kind of start you know the the hardest step is the first one um and to start it's as simple as kind of you know talking over anything your own game footage your your friend's game footage and nothing really replaces the hours put in though i think that's the the biggest learning experience i've had um is your your pure hours behind the microphone is what is going to give you some of the biggest output to to get that trial and error through you're going to need to have a lot of uh a lot of experience in there you don't get that experience uh without without just putting in the hours so you know it's like you know trying to be in helicopter pilot or something you need a thousand hours before you can be certified into stuff whatever and then two thousand hours etc it's not quite like that in esports but typically speaking like you know the more you've done something the better that at it you should really be so um you know by that the the kind of general I would say pathway it's not very well defined i like to think of any sort of talent-based industry it's like you're trying to be an actor or a musician there's not like a well-defined thing it's kind of you know a lot of it will come down to your own effort and your own talent as well so your mileage may vary mm. absolutely well there might not be any defined pathway but practice determination and as you said uh a headset with a microphone attached and yeah maybe one day we can uh uh, get to where you're, uh, where you're at. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. We really appreciate your insights, both as a broadcast talent and, of course, an industry expert. Now, we're going to take a quick break and be right back with more Get Into Gaming soon. We'll see you soon.
guys. In this interview, we have Ian Lan Seaton. Hi, Ian. Hey, Kahu. Uh, thank you for having us in the, your studio today. Um, now, tell us, who are you and what do you do? Um, so, my name is Ian uh, Lan Seaton. Or just call me Ian or Lan, either one's fine. Um, so, I am an eSport organization owner. And so, I operate uh, New Zealand's, I suppose, most active eSport organization. And we have some players that are based in New Zealand and or Australia. And we support these players for either the titles Valorant or Dota 2 uh, to help them compete and to help them, I suppose, reach new heights as competitive players. That's awesome. Um, now tell us a little bit about the organization that um, you said you, that you mentioned. And how did you come about bringing that? Like, how, how, did, that, how did you form that and get it to where it is today? Um, so Shadownet is a esport organization that is focused around Dota 2 and Valorant. Uh, we started off with Rainbow Six, and we had some other titles like Street Fighter Tekken back in the day, and we also had Legends of Runeterra, um, or sorry, Magic the Gathering as well. But we've narrowed, narrowed it down to these two titles because we want to focus on these teams um, and really support them. Um, other than that, we, we love making content. We love making uh, we, little videos. Um, other than that, we are we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. You know, we're broadcasting for the um, New Meta High School New Zealand Esport League, powered by MSI. It's a it's a it's a bit of a, a mouth, it's a bit of a mouthful. mouthful. <laughs> yeah, um, we so we're broadcasting for that, and we also um, help um, as well as manage a lot of um, a couple of influencers as well, um, and as well as are the marketing partners for MSI New Zealand. That's awesome. So it sounds like there's a lot more to just having a passion for games. It sounds like you need to have quite an understanding of how to run a business yeah. and how to interact with people. Um, would you say that's right? And would you say that you need a bit of an understanding of how that works to have a successful organization in gaming? Yes, yeah, so a absolutely. I think um, I think there's an oversight with running an organization for a lot of people that start it. You do see a lot of young organizations um, run over in Australia and New Zealand as well. And there have been a lot of organizations in New Zealand that have come and gone. I feel like the one thing that everyone overlooks is how to make, uh, how to keep it sustainable and um, I suppose uh, to, to really maintain and manage its longevity. Because when it comes to running an organization, Traditionally, esport organizations go for funding rounds. You know, they they look for investors, they sell a share, and then they say, "Hey, look, um, my org is worth this much." You know, and then I will sell you ten percent of that org for X amount of money, and then they use that money to you know pay for people's wages and salaries to create more content, which in turn actually adds in value to that organization. Even as a player, I suppose that really that's that's also really important as a player because if you're a player and let's say you're dedicating all your time to being a uh, Fortnite Pro, and uh, we we talked about this at the media design school thing. Um, so, where you place your time is very important as a player, mm. because if you're going to dedicate all your time to um, being the best at Fortnite, but you have like a million people to compete with, you really have to be the best, right? Or maybe you're better off trying your hand at a at a game with a smaller community where you're more likely to be seen, picked up and be put into an environment where you can actually uh, grow. Cool. Now, what would you say to any kids that wanted to have a future um, working in an esports organization? What would, what would you say as words of encouragement or advice? Um, I'll start with advice, right? So with advice, I would recommend finding a passion, whether it's art, whether it's organization, whether it's marketing, um, do you like making people look good? Do you like being the person to record the videos? Or do you want to be the person that writes the, the stories about the videos? You know, do you want to be the person that um, is the cameraman behind the eSport games? Or do you want to be the, the guy behind the desk presenting the games? Or maybe just, just like everybody else, um, you want to be the player, you know? Whatever your passion is, if eSports is something that you're interested in, the easiest thing to do to understand how to get in. Just be an upstanding citizen. Mm -hmm. And um, when you speak to people on, on, on social media, don't just like say, haha, this is a funny video, right? Because no one's gonna take, a, take, a, uh, take notice of you. You have to, I suppose, try to bring an opinion 
and try to and try to keep an open mind with things because not everyone's going to be always right. Now that's the only advice I can really give. You know, like be active in social media and sort of like reach out to the communities through online gaming, um, and be uh, an upstanding citizen and player that people want to be around. You know, it doesn't matter if you're bad, but if you're fun to be around and you're a nice person and you're you know humble. People will want you there no matter what, and that's how a lot of pro players pick up like their new their new team uh, their team their new team members. Um, and in terms of um, sort of like encouragement, honestly, don't give up. You know, like esports is pretty wild. Uh, it's the wild west, and it's it's starting to get more structured here in New Zealand um, and Australia, but. Stick with it. Find a group of people that that love esports just as much as you do, and that want to compete, and compete with them. You know, there are so many small tournaments that you can enter. You know, there's let the Let's Play Life have weekend tournaments all the time. Um, ESL have tournaments all the time. Face it, there's so many tournament organizers. Victory Up as well. Weekend cups with Victory Up are great. You know, um, just enter all the time. And if you lose, it's okay. Pick yourself back up. Get your teammates back up. Enter again. If you lose a hundred times, that's a hundred lessons you can learn from. That's all I can say. Yeah, no, and I can. I've definitely noticed that there's more um, school tournaments out yeah. these days compared to when I was in high school. So I'd recommend you guys make the most of that, even if you just go along to attend and not as a competitor. Awesome, thank you, Ian. Thank you so much for your time. You guys can find out more about Ian on our Get Into Gaming website. We appreciate you coming in and talking to us. Thanks, Kahu. Thanks, Thanks. Ian. <laughs>that's it for today's episode we've heard from some very special guests about gaming's most competitive scene and hope that you've learned a little bit more about the gaming industry and how you might find your place in it are you looking to become a pro gamer competing against some of the world's best players or do you feel like you have what it takes to commentate on some of the most intense matches and tournaments around new zealand and the world we'll return tomorrow with more about esports and the future of gaming Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.